Hello and welcome to this channel. My name is Victoria and in this video we will talk about birth defects in the urinary tract and kidneys in children. The urinary tract consists of the kidneys, the ureters, the urinary bladder and the urethra and in every of these parts anomalies can occur. Many structural abnormalities can already be found while the baby is still inside the uterus so antenatal, and those abnormalities are usually screened for. This screening is important because before it was routinely done, children were often diagnosed later in childhood or even adult life when the anomaly causes symptoms. Abnormalities in the urinary tract occur in around 1 out of 200 to 400 births. If the defects are not identified early and taken care for, they can damage the developing organs and cause problems for the rest of the life of the child. Congenital anomalies can be associated with abnormal development or abnormal function of the organs and can make the child more susceptible to infections after birth. In the next part, we will talk about the anomalies that can occur in each of the parts of the urinary system. They are numerous, but I will try to keep it as short and simple as possible. Let's start at the very top, or the most su superior aspect, with the kidneys. They can have anomalies in their number, size, position, relation to each other, their structure, or their blood supply. Anomalies in the number of the kidneys include agenesia, aplasia, unilateral multicystic dysplasia, and supernumerary kidneys. In agenesis, there is the complete missing of one or both of the kidneys, while in aplasia, one or both of the kidneys develop in their most primitive form, but not further than that. In unilateral multicystic dysplasia, one of the kidneys develops normally, while the other one develops as irregular cysts that are differently large, these cysts are usually not functional. In supernumerary kidneys, the child has more than two kidneys. They may or may not be fused together to the other ones. This defect usually results from an abnormal separation of the embryonal structure that usually forms the kidney. Anomalies in the size of the kidney can be simple hypoplasia, hypoplasia with dysplasia, oligonephronia, nephronophthysis of Fanconi, and segmental hypoplasia. In the simple hypoplasia, there is one kidney that is significantly smaller than the other one. It usually also has less nephrons, so functional units of the kidney. In hypoplasia with dysplasia, there is one significantly smaller kidney than the other, in which the renal tissue develops unorganized and undifferentiated, so there are some normal nephrons and some that don't develop properly and are non-functional. Nephronophthesis of Fanconi is an autosomal recessive disease in which the patient usually has a chronic tubulo-interstitial nephritis due to inflammation and scarring of the nephrons, which leads eventually to renal failure, usually during the second decade of life in the juvenile form or before the age of five in the infantile form. Oligonephronia is a congenital defect in which the kidney has less than normal number of nephrons, but the ones that are present are usually functional. Segmental renal hypoplasia, or ask upmark kidney, is a type of kidney hypoplasia that usually leads to severe hypertension. In this defect, some areas of the kidney don't develop normally. They usually present with scar formation, atrophy of the tubules, and hyperplasia of the renal blood vessels. In the affected segment, often no or only few glomeruli can be found. Anomalies in the position of the kidney include homolateral dystopia or simple ectopy as well as heterolateral dystopia or crossed ectopy. 
the kidneys develop inside the pelvis and during the development of the baby they normally rise up to their normal position. But sometimes they do not rise up together or one of the kidneys does not find its physiological position and is found somewhere else in the body. In cases of homolateral ectopy, the kidney is in the same side of the body but at a different level, while in crossed ectopy, the kidney is in the other side of the body. In homolateral dystopia, the kidney may be found in the pelvis, iliac area, lumbar area, or the chest. In heterolateral dystopia, the crossed kidney may or may not fuse with the other one that is located in its normal position. The kidney can also be mal rotated so that the hilum, where the blood vessels, nerve, and ureter go in and out of the kidney, is not pointing towards the spine but towards the flank. Nephroptosis is another condition in which the kidney drops into the pelvis when the patient stands up and goes back to its normal position when sitting. This is also called floating kidney and occurs more frequently in women than men. Anomalies in the relation between the kidneys usually means that the kidneys fuse. This can occur in different forms and usually describes the way we see the kidney on an x-ray or in a sonography. The kidneys can fuse to form a horseshoe kidney where the two lower poles or isthmus of the kidney fuse. They can also fuse to form an L-shape or an S-shape. Anomalies in the structure of the kidney include usually cyst formations that occur in either one or both of the kidneys. The cyst can be only one, called solitary kidney cyst, and in the case of only one kidney having one cyst, it is called solitary unilateral kidney. If one kidney has several cysts, we call it multilocular unilateral cyst. Also included in this group is the polycystic kidney disease. This is an inherited disorder and can occur either as an autosomal recessive or autosomal dominant disease. The cysts occur all over the kidneys in different sizes and in the long run usually lead to chronic kidney failure. The last group about the kidneys are the vascular anomalies. This can include aberrant renal arteries so that not only one renal artery goes into the hilum of the kidney, but one or two extra arteries. Also, a stenosis or aneurysm of the renal artery or its branches is possible. In the next part we will talk about anomalies of the calices, the pelvis and the ureters. The calices are small cup-shaped spaces that collect the urine that is produced in the kidneys and give it further into the ureters. Anomalies of the calices include caliceal diverticulas and megacalicosis. In caliceal diverticulum is an outpouching of the calyxes seen. This is a rather rare birth defect. In around 50% of patients, also a stone is found in these outpouchings and they predispose the patient for infections of the kidney. Megacalicosis Another rare congenital anomaly is that the renal calices are dilated, while the renal pelvis and ureter are usually normal. This dilation can be seen in an x-ray with contrast, and the calices make up most of the space in the kidney and can impair the normal function of the glomeruli. Now we will talk about the renal pelvis and the ureters. For this part, it is important to know about the pilo ureteral segment, so where the renal pelvis, where the urine is collected, meets the ureter that leads the urine to the urinary bladder. This part can be hypoplastic or hyperplastic, as well as sclerosed, with additional valves, or there can be adhesions or kinks in the segment. In the case of a hypoplastic pilo ureteral segment, the connection between the two structures is short and narrow. In the case of a hyperplastic segment, it is usually dilated and funnel-shaped. All the before-mentioned anomalies 
can obstruct the outflow of urine in the kidney and can cause it to back up and lead to hydronephrosis and pressure atrophy of the renal parenchyma, as well as predisposition for infections of the kidneys. There can also be anomalies in the number of ureters. There can be a complete ureteral duplication, so that two completely formed ureters join the kidney and the pelvis and lead into the urinary bladder. It is also possible that the ureter is only doubled in a specific part of the entire length. It is usually divided into duplication of the upper, middle or lower third of the ureter. The next part we will talk about is the ureterovesical segment, so where the ureter goes into the urinary bladder. This includes a mega ureter of mechanical causes as well as a mega ureter of dynamic causes. Mega ureter is the term for a pathologically dilated ureter that is much wider in diameter than it usually should be. In numbers, if it is more than 7 mm wide. Mechanical causes include a stenosis at some level, so that the ureter is widened due to urine, urine accumulation, ureteral diverticula, bladder diverticula and ectopic ureteral orifices. An ectopic ureteral orifice is when the ureter connects to the bladder somewhere else than the trigone of the bladder, where it usually should connect. The connection point is usually lower than the trigone, so that the urine flows in at the bottom of the bladder. It is also possible that the ureter connects directly to the urethra, which leads to incontinence. Dynamic causes of a mega ureter include congenital vesico-ureterorenal reflux, so that the urine flows from the bladder back to the kidney and distends the ureter. Ureterocele, so an outpouching of the most distal part of the ureter, which can block the drainage of urine from the ureter into the bladder. Now we will talk about anomalies of the bladder. The anomalies include agenesia, so that the bladder does not form at all, hypoplasia, so that the bladder forms but is much smaller than usually, duplicated bladder, so that there are two urinary bladders draining into one urethra, or two urinary bladders draining in each its own urethra. It is also possible that one bladder is divided into two by a septum, so a tissue strand dividing the cavity. Other anomalies of the bladder include the vesico-vaginal fistula, where the bladder and vagina have a connection and the urine can flow through this connection and bladder extrophy. Bladder extrophy is a huge topic in itself, but to break it down, it is when the abdominal wall does not fully develop and the hip bones are usually malformed so that the bladder is exposed to the outside environment. This usually is accompanied by anomalies of the genital organs and the surgery is necessary to bring the bladder back into the abdomen and to correct the position and structure of the other organs and hip bones. Now we already made it quite far. All that is left for now is the anomalies in the point where the bladder goes over into the urethra and the urethra itself. Anomalies in the point where the bladder meets the urethra, so the vesico urethral segment, include sclerosis of the neck of the bladder so that the outflow of the bladder is narrow and in some cases completely closed. Due to the sclerosis, the bladder neck cannot open properly when it should to release the urine, and so the urine can flow back into the kidneys. Other anomalies are valves in the urethra, which can be either coming from the anterior or posterior aspect of the urethra. These tissue flaps can prevent the urine from flowing out. The urethra may also not form at all, called urethral agenesia, or it may be two urethras, calling duplicated urethra. In case of male patients, the opening of the urethra can be located at another site than the tip of the penis. In hypospadias, the opening is located at the underside and can be found anywhere from the perineum to the glans penis. 
In 20% of cases, it occurs at a posterior aspect, in 30% in the middle part or shaft, and in 50% in the anterior aspect, so either glandular or subcoronal. Another anomaly is epispadias. This one can also occur in girls. In girls, epispadias usually shows as the opening of the urethra being wider, the mons pubis is flattened, and the urethra is shorter than usually, and the clitoris and symphysis pubis is split in the middle, so they do not unite in the middle. In boys, epispadias shows as the opening of the urethra on the dorsal side of the penis, and the corpora carvanosa are usually split, and the corpus bongiosum does not form. When we examine a patient in regards of the congenital anomalies of the urinary tract, we want to keep special attention to the anamnesis and ask about the urinary stream, prior urinary tract infections, a family history of renal diseases, polyuria, so frequent urination, polydipsia, so increased thirst, and enuresis, so bad wetting. The diagnosis is usually done antenatally, so in the ultrasound before the baby is born, but sometimes further imaging techniques are done. Or a congenital anomaly might not be seen in the antenatal screening. Especially used is the ultrasound examination, but also contrast X-rays and CTs. Sometimes also chromosomal and genetic testing is done, especially in some structural anomaly that is found or suspected to be familial. That's it for this video. Thank you for watching and if you like our channel, please subscribe. And hopefully see you again in the next video.